Let me read to you a passage from the 24th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 35 to 48. It's the Gospel for Easter Thursday. St. Luke writes, Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what, it is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. That's from Luke chapter 24, verses 35 to 48, for Easter Thursday. What does it suggest to us? Well, it tells us, what it is to realize the living Christ. You know, at the time of my writing this, of my telling you this, abortion laws are being passed in Spain, a country where the majority of citizens are at least nominally Catholic. It is said that the rate of abortion is much the same in Catholic countries as in others, despite the Church's teaching. The Catholic Church is the largest in body among the Christian denominations, and theoretically it ought to be a giant in influence, but it is a sleeping giant in terms of its grassroots membership. The fact is that a majority of Catholics do not go to Mass each Sunday, and it is misleading to quote the number of baptized Catholics because it can give the impression that that number represents the number of believing, convinced Catholics. The same can be said, and with even greater emphasis, about the number of Christians in the world. England and Australia could be called Christian countries in the, in the sense that most of its citizens regard themselves as in some sense Christian. But for all the influence the Christian element has on society, those two countries would be better termed secular countries. What is lacking? Of course, the answers to that, to that question are multiple, but one thing that is lacking is simply a realization of the truth of the doctrines of the Christian faith, a realization of them. Cardinal Newman often drew a distinction between a notion and a realization. A person may have a notion of, say, Christ or the Church, while another may have a realization of Christ or the Church. For the former, Christ is just a notion, an image, a thought. He is not a living fact. His reality may not be positively denied, but it is not positively apprehended. He is a figure of the past, and the past is gone. For the latter, Christ is a real person, and the Church is truly his body, the locale and the means of his living presence. Christ is not just a figure of the past, for he lives now in his full humanity and divinity. He is accepted as being truly alive. This is a realization, not a notion. The former is a mere notion. Religion will never be a real force in our lives as long as it is a mere notion. The Christian must truly realize that Jesus Christ suffered, died, and truly rose. He lives now and is with us. The Gospel that I read earlier from Luke chapter 24 verses 35 to 48 
for Easter Thursday, records, let us say, the transformation in the Apostles of their notion or memory of Christ into a realization of his living reality. He had gone from this world under terrible circumstances, and his body lay in the tomb. His life was over and finished, and with it so were the hopes and dreams of his loyal disciples. All they now had was a memory, recent, devastating, appalling and crippling, but a memory nevertheless. All they could look forward to was a receding memory of the Master. In due course, perhaps they could pick up again and live according to his teaching and his memory and live according to his memory too and spread his teaching as they knew it. More disciples would follow, as had been the case with John the Baptist. The Baptist had gone and his disciples had recovered his body from Herod's precincts and had buried it. Years later, there would be many disciples of John scattered here and there and the infant church would come across them. It could have been supposed that the legacy of Jesus of Nazareth would have lived on in a similar manner. His teaching about God and the way to him would be preserved and perhaps put into writing as had the teaching of many of the ancient prophets. But he would become a memory. We might almost say a notion. But no, this is not what happened. And the reason for it was that they saw him, met him, spoke with him, and even felt him in his physical reality after he had risen from the dead. He was apprehended as a living reality. No holy man had raised him from the dead, as he had raised others from the dead during his public ministry. He raised himself from the dead. I freely lay down my life, he had told them, and I shall freely take it up again. And this he did. He took up life again, but it was a new and glorious life, and they saw him in the flesh. Our gospel gives us the account of their meeting with him. They saw and spoke with him as a group, despite their complete scepticism about the reports they had received during that first day. They gathered around him and watched him even eat. They were now filled with a profound realization of the living Jesus, risen now from the dead and glorious. What we, each of us, must do is strive to realize the living fact of Jesus Christ. We do not see him, but he is real. He lives and he is always near. He is our saviour and we ought to strive to be filled with a realization that he, our friend, brother, saviour and God is more real than we ourselves. Our entire reality depends on him because it is through him that all things exist. On this basis, we can proceed to shape our lives according to Christ's teaching. Indeed, as Cardinal Newman used to say, the world is a mere veil when compared with the unseen. And in the first instance, that unseen reality behind the veil is Jesus Christ. Let us be real and not nominal Christians, then, with a lively faith that is made up not of mere notions, but of realizations.